for we have sinned against you and not obeyed your commandments. But give glory to your name and deal with us according to the bounty of your mercy. All that you have done to us, O Lord, you have done with true judgment. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. We hear a continuation of our readings from last week into this week about envy, jealousy, those things which are poisoning our relationships, causing all kinds of damage for us, and really not helping us to get ready for heaven and divine life. And Jesus even goes so far to say, if it's there, just pluck it out. If it's holding you back from being able to join divine life, make sure to cut it off or pluck it out of our lives. My dear sisters and brothers, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ have, mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. O God, who manifest your almighty power above all by pardoning and showing mercy, bestow, we pray, your grace abundantly upon us and make those hastening to attain your promises heirs to the treasures of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Numbers. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, the Lord bestowed it on the 70 elders. And as the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied. Now two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, were not in the gathering, but had been left in the camp they too had been on the list, but had not gone out to the tent. Yet the Spirit came to rest on them also, and they prophesied in the camp. So when a young man quickly told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, Joshua, son of Nun, who from his youth had been Moses' aide, said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses answered him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people of the Lord were prophets. Would that the Lord might bestow his spirit on them all. The word of the Lord. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, it revives the soul. The decrees of the Lord are steadfast. They give wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. The fear of the Lord is pure, abiding forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, they are all of them just. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. So in them your servant finds instruction, great reward is in their keeping. But who can detect their own errors from hidden faults acquit me? The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. From presumption restrain your servant, may it not rule me. Then shall I be blameless, clean from grave sin. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. A reading from the letter of St. James. Come now, you rich, weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away, and your clothes have become moth-eaten. 
your gold and silver have corroded, and that corrosion will be a testimony against you. It will devour your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasure for the last days. Behold, the wages you withheld from your workers who harvested your fields are crying aloud, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous one. He offers you no resistance. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At that time, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not belong to us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, It would be better for him if a great millstone were put up around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The Gospel of the Lord. It's one Gehenna of a gospel, huh? Uh, That's not my joke. I stole that from another priest. But it's still... The whole point, we're talking about hell today, just so we're clear. We are talking about hell. (laughs) Uh, this does come up in the gospel, and, and for us to understand, you know, what is the Lord getting at? When the Lord speaks of hell and purgatory and heaven, what are the, the points of talking about this? You know, um, we, last week we had a reflection on envy and jealousy as sins, that, that, that impurity that grows within us. Remember a few weeks ago, Jesus saying that it's, it's those things from inside the heart that come out. Those are what cause 
uh, death for ourselves. Those are what bring us impurity in our life. Those make us unclean. And we, we saw, I mean, Father Gabriel spoke last week. I think he talked about jealousy and envy and how those poison relationships for us. To recognize Jesus, he uses this image of Gehenna quite intentionally. Now, it, since we're not from Jerusalem, we wouldn't really understand this uh, for ourselves so much, but Gehenna is a literal place, okay? It's part of the valley that surrounds the territory of Jerusalem there. And in a city of several hundred thousand people at the time of Jesus, where do you put your garbage? There's no, there's no collection service that goes around to people collecting garbage. So people would bring their garbage out and dump it in Gehenna. It's a big garbage pit in the valley. It smells, it's horrible, it's awful. And at some point, a fire started. And it's been, it was just going and going and going and an unquenchable fire in the garbage pit. Yuck. So Jesus using this imagery, if there's some sin in your life, better for you to get rid of that sin than to be thrown into Gehenna. You're, everybody goes, yeah, no, no Gehenna for me. Thank you very much. That's hell right there. Good image for myself. I need, because I don't live around a giant garbage dump, I need something that's more referential in my own life when it comes to sin to be able to say, well, what would hell be like? And then if you've been to my funeral homilies, you would have heard me talk about, well, the image that I give for myself is me and my brother having a fight, okay? So, you know my brother, Father Matthew, from over in Purim, now he's down in Alexandria, now he's the priest down there, two priests in the family, I know, it's so exciting. And we love traveling together, the two of us. We love traveling. While we're traveling, uh, I need lots of information when I'm driving. And I like to drive. That puts me at the advantage, of course. He does not like to drive. And then he is the type, even though I need, you know, how many turns is it? Can you please look ahead on the map and let me know? And he's, I'll let you know when we get there. <sighs> so we always get along. No, we don't always get along. Imagine I get so frustrated and angry with him that, you know, we get to the next gas station and I'm thinking to myself, he's a big boy, he's got credit cards, he's got a cell phone, he'll figure it out. And I just shut the door and I take off. That's what people do to one another. They yell, they scream, we slam doors, we say hurtful things. We do all kinds of violence towards one another. Just turn on the news and you see how horrible the world is. Human beings who should love one another, who choose to take stuff out in one another and be mean to one another, say hurtful things, cause all kinds of violations of the commandment towards God and one another, you know, if the Lord, if heaven is love all the time, if heaven is this place of joy and peace where we're supposed to look at one another and be at peace with one another, you know, if the Lord, here I'm driving away, feeling like I got away with all of this and my brother is fuming mad at me, and the Lord pulls us both up into heaven, welcome to the joy of heaven. The two of you get to sit next to each other for all of eternity. That would be hell. That's the Gehenna for me. I don't need much more. Any of the adults in the room that have ever gone to family gatherings or we go to social events and then we see that person, that one that has just been so, such a pain in our personal life. We want to avoid them at all cost. And to imagine that we would get to heaven and see that person there and Jesus smiling and happy and hugging them and we go, are you kidding me? You're going to let them into heaven? No, thank you. That would be hell. To choose to live with an unresolved part of sin in my life, I'm not willing to forgive them or I'm not willing to say I'm sorry forever. I've heard people say that. I will, I will never forgive that person. Never. I'll never forgive them for what they've done. And maybe it's hyperbole. Maybe it's stretching it a little bit. But really? Like never? Even if you saw Jesus fix everything between the two of you, that they paid back every ounce that they owe and you pay back every ounce that you owe and everything's at peace 
where you could look at them in love and be peaceful with them, you wouldn't want it then? You, wouldn't, you would say no still? So we have to be careful in our relationships. And this is why when we talk about the seven deadly sins, envy being one of them, um, that we're evaluating our life and our relationships at all time because we never know when the Lord will take us next. We never know. We have to be ready at all times to make a testament with our life. If Jesus, if after I die, Jesus walks through step by step of my life and starts showing me the sins that I've done, I can tell you by the time I reach 10th grade, that's enough for me. Jesus, just please, ah, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not going to be able to survive in heaven. It's going to be miserable for me after you've shown me all my sins. I don't, I, I haven't, like I got 50 more years to go. I can't stand it, seeing my sin in front of me. And Jesus doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to sit in the rot of our sins. He wants us to be free. He wants us to enjoy heaven, to be at peace with one another. He is invested in my being healed, in your being healed, in being able to look at one another. So we look at those seven deadly sins. What are they again now? Pride. Pride is when I exaggerate things. It's You know, the fish, how big was the sunfish? Oh gosh, probably this big. We caught four of them, yeah, okay. That's prideful, you just tell the truth. Okay, it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was small, okay. Or we underestimate it. Oh, it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah, it was a big deal, don't underestimate it. That's pride, don't let that get in the way of relationships. Don't exaggerate yourself, don't underestimate yourself. Tell the truth of what is. So we got pride. We've got um, greed. We heard about that in the second reading. Just piling up all that cash, piling up all those things in my yard and in my house. And in the end, can you bring it with you? No. It's just going to sit and rot. So what's the point? Why that constant pursuit of the next best thing? I always have to have the best. I always have to have the next. Why that pursuit? It's dragging your soul down. It's getting in the way of your relationships. You work, 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 and you avoid your family. So there's a pride, greed, wrath, our anger. We're holding on to that anger. It's either too much anger where it's just, blah, it just comes out and it causes all kinds of damage. We exaggerate. We say things we shouldn't say. We cause violence and pain to one another. Or we don't get angry enough. It's too little. Something evil is happening and we're just laughing about it. <laughs> I missed mass last weekend. <laughs> oh well. You're, you're not enough angry about it. Um, let's see, gluttony. Now this can be too much of something or it can be too nice of something. That, you know, I, I, that's my, it's not so much lots of food, although I eat lots of food. That's obvious to everybody. Okay. Too much putting on my plate. But it also can be that I'm... You know, I I'm, 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 uh, I'm always have to have the nicest stuff. I always have to eat the nicest food. I, I, well, from McDonald's, I never eat McDonald's. <laughs> okay. Or whatever it is that we say is not, that is not, we're not worthy of that. And then we've got a sloth. Sloth is that resistance to doing good things. This is probably something that is happening all the time and we're not paying attention to it. Sloth, it's, hey kids, we're going to pray the rosary together. Ugh. I didn't hear, I don't want to hear, just resistance to doing that which is good. We, we sometimes call sloth laziness, like, oh, I didn't, I didn't get to my prayers, or I, I didn't do the thing, I didn't do the dishes like I should have, I guess I was slothful. No, it's about what is good, what is holy, what is the right thing to do, and am I living up to it? Am I doing it? So you got slothfulness, and then um, there is uh, lust. Did I get through five there? I hope I did. Lust. Lust is that inordinate desire of my sexual appetite where I'm going too far in my relationships and there are areas that I shouldn't be doing. I'll leave that at that. All the adults in the room know what I'm talking about. And then, uh, hopefully I got them all there. <laughs> and then the last one being envy that we had heard about last week and we hear more about this week. Now, jealousy, if you remember Father Gabriel mentioning this, jealousy is that little pain in my heart where I I want what somebody else has of success. 
I want what somebody else has. It looks like this. Hey kids, guess what's going to happen? We're going to go tubing today. We're going to go tubing. We're out at the lake. We're going to pull the tube and all the kids get to go on a ride. Who wants to go tubing? Me, me, me. I want to go tubing. Oh great, oh good. Okay, and you get to go first. And all the kids go, yay, you get to go first. Right? Or does it sound something like this? And you get to go first. And all the other kids go, Oh, I never get to go first. He always gets to go first. That's jealousy. It's a little pain in the heart. I wish it was me. Now, where it gets deadly is when that escalates into envy. Envy says, I will not celebrate the good thing in your life. I will not celebrate it. Yesterday we held the raffle in Bluffton. Maybe there's a bunch of Bluffton folks who are here for Mass today and we're drawing the tickets out. We're getting ready. The grand prize of a bajillion dollars goes to, and I don't remember who it went to, but all the adults in the room, we all know what envy feels like. It sounds like this, right? So uh, a bajillion dollars goes to Erica Keppers. Now she didn't win it, but just let's pretend she did for the moment. And we all have jealousy at first. It's the grand prize of a bajillion dollars. Ugh. It was supposed to be me. And then the next step starts coming in in our heart. First it's quiet in our heart and then it starts coming out into our relationships. Well, she doesn't deserve that. Erica, she's got a good paying job. I need the money. And we start to, on the inside, we either have to tear her down or we have to build us up. Well, I won the grand prize last year, so I'm glad you won, but you know. We're both big winners. We have to tear her down or we have to build ourselves up. We can't just celebrate the joy of the moment. And the reason we call these deadly sins is it's not so much that that first instance happens, but it's a capital sin. It sits on the top and then it just sort of trickles downhill into all kinds of other sins that bring death into our relationship. So suddenly, we go from just simply having this little evil in our heart to, I have to verbalize it out loud. Oh, did you hear what happened with Erica? Oh yeah, she won the big prize. She's a big prize where she gets all the money. All the money? I didn't hear she got all the money. She got a lot of money. She stole a bank. Did somebody say she stole a bank? I can't believe she stole a bank. Is she in prison? I think she got arrested yesterday. Erica Keppers got arrested? Did you hear that? She's going to prison. When did that happen? Yesterday at Bluffton. She's out on parole right now, sitting in the pew. And it just trickles into all this gossip, doesn't it? And there's names for parts of those things. When we use the truth as a weapon against another person, it's called detraction. Erica doesn't deserve it. She makes enough money. I'm using that as a weapon against her. It's a poison in my relationship. Or then I start saying things that are not true and exaggerating it. Oh, her husband, Bob, he's on the committee, so I'm sure he got her name pushed up to the front. I'm sure of it. Are you sure? Did you check into it? Did you actually look into it? Probably not, right? And we start lying and we're stretching the truth. That's, that's now calumny. And it just keeps trickling down. We're saying hurtful things. We see Erica the next time. You deserve prison, Erica. (laughs) Erica, so sorry that I just picked you out of the crowd today. All right, she's a good sport. (laughs) So now I need to undo the damage that I'm doing, right? Now, now, this is a great... A great little story here. Um, this is a fictional story, I'm sure. I don't know if it actually happened or not. But, you know, somebody goes to confession. They go to the priest. They, they go to, Father, forgive me for I've sinned. It's been this long since my last confession. I participated in some gossip and I told some lies and I told some untruths and all of that kind of stuff. And then the, the priest says, for your penance, I'd like you to go home, find your feather pillow, Take it outside, cut the top open, and throw all the feathers in the air. That's your penance. All right. I guess I'll go do that. And so the person goes out, cuts the, throws it out in the backyard where no one's looking because it's really embarrassing to fluff the feathers everywhere. A few weeks later, the person goes back to confession again. Father, forgive me for I've sinned. It's been this long since my last confession. I did some gossip again, and I did this sin, and I did this sin. 
The priest says, your penance now is to go and pick up all the feathers. That's what happens with gossip, doesn't it? Saying a bunch of lies, saying a bunch of hurtful things, it just goes out. How are we supposed to get it back? And we have to be very careful in our spiritual life, how that brings death. Now, imagine Jesus showing us in our life that moment, and we go, oh. And then he says, well, look what this happened. You spread it not only to yourself, but you said it out loud, and now so-and-so believed what you said, and they went and told somebody else, and it trickled down to there, and trickled down to there, and trickled down to there. Do you see why Jesus says you can't have this envy between one another? If there's a sin in your life, for far be it to happen that you would lead someone else into sin. And now at the end of the life, they have to look at what they did. They believe something they shouldn't have believed in. They got caught up into all of it. So the drastic nature of Jesus saying, it is better for you to cut your hand off and walk into heaven maimed without the sin than it is to sit there and go, they get to be here in heaven? No way. I'll keep my two hands and I'll sit outside of life. Thank you very much. What we choose to do really does matter. And now the, the wonderful thing about God is even if we've done the worst, even if we're sitting here and Father Aaron's going through this list and it's just, oh my gosh, what is, I, I am a sinner. It's not about earning heaven. We don't earn heaven. Being a good person doesn't get you in. What happens is all of us, we are all sinners. We all need God's grace. We all need his mercy and his forgiveness. And so at some point, we have to be able to face what's happened and be able to say, I'm sorry for what I did. And I desire to make it up. I've done wrong and I want to get it fixed. Those two things are the things that would happen when we go to confession. Forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. I did this sin. And then the priest says, your penance is go cut open your pillowcase and spread the feathers everywhere. We do the penance to help make up the damage. In our house, we grow up with our kids all the time. And what do we do? We try to teach each other love. We know that stuff happens between us, spouses and kids and family members. And we have a big fight. We can't do cancel culture. It doesn't work in family life. You stole the Legos from your sister, you're banished from the family. No, we wouldn't do that. What would we say? We'd say, you know, let's, let's try to share. Let's learn to love one another. Let's learn to get back into relationship with one another. Let's try to heal what's broken. Let's hand it back. Let's give your sister a hug. Give your brother a hug. And we have to do that. To be at peace with one another in heaven requires this reconciliation and healing. I will never forgive that person. Well, you're going to have to learn to do it. And the way to do it is to realize Jesus is going to take care of everything. He will solve everything. Your job is to simply say, I want them in heaven. I want them to be there. Because now imagine the thief on the cross. There's the thief on the cross. He's sitting next to Jesus. Jesus being crucified right next to him. The thief deserves to be there. He deserves to be there for his sins. He's being crucified for being a thief and ruining someone else's life. And the person might be sitting in the crowd and looking up and seeing the thief and going, yup, thank you that the government did that and took care of that person because, man, that just they ruined my life. And we would be justified. But now to hear Jesus look over to the thief and the thief look to Jesus and say, Jesus, please, when you enter into your kingdom, let me enter into paradise with you. And Jesus saying to him and saying, yes, Today you will be with me in paradise. Can I rejoice as the person who sees my enemy on the cross? Can I rejoice at them and say, yes, I want them in heaven. Yes, they converted at the last moment. Praise the Lord Jesus. Or will I sit with envy and go, Jesus, what are you doing? How could you let that person off the hook? Well, they're not off the hook. They are hanging on the hook. <laughs> All of us have to do that with our life. The beauty of confession is that it gives us the opportunity to review that moment of our life and get our sins taken care of now. We don't have to wait till the end of our life. We can receive this graciousness and mercy because God does not want any of us in hell. He doesn't want that. 
He wants my, 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 the best of me to be enjoying in heaven. He wants me to make it. He wants every person to make it. And will I surrender and let him do that? Will I let him bring about life within me? And if there's something holding me back, am I willing to go to drastic measures of reconciliation and healing and forgiveness to try to be at peace with God, with my neighbor, with nature itself so that I can enjoy heaven forever? That's what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to enjoy heaven. And so may envy or jealousy or any of those deadly sins never hold us back. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in our Father's care, we bring our needs and prayers before him. For Pope Francis's intentions for September, that all people will embrace the virtue of simplicity in how they live and be good stewards of the resources of this earth. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace and harmony between those nations set against one another, that disputes between persons may be reconciled in charity and goodwill. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to the pandemic, that those who administer to the sick may be blessed with the gift of healing and attentiveness to each patient's needs. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all students and teachers at the beginning of this academic year, that they may grow in knowledge and understanding of how the world works and become wise in how to live in the world in a manner that reflects the moral teachings of Jesus. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to jealousy and destructive competition among members of our families, that envy and ambition may be replaced with encouragement and service. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the repose of the souls of the departed, that they may rest in the peace of God's kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord our God, you love us so much. You desire us in heaven with you. You know that there are sins in our life that need to be weeded out. And so by your grace and your love and your mercy, your forgiveness and healing, we can be at peace with one another. Please hear all of these prayers. We ask them through Christ our Lord. Amen. God, we bless you. God, we name you 
sovereign Lord, mighty King, whom angels worship, Father by your church adored. All creation shows your glory, heaven and earth draw near your throne, singing holy, 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 Lord of hosts and God alone. True apostles, faithful prophets, saints who set their world ablaze, martyrs once unknown, unheeded, join one growing song of praise. While your church on earth confesses one majestic trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, our hope eternally. Jesus Christ, the King of glory, everlasting Son of God, humble was your virgin mother, hard alone. by grace. Christ at God's right hand victorious, you will judge the world you made. Lord in mercy, help your servants for whose freedom you have paid. Raise us up from dust to
pray, my dear brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God of the Almighty Father. Grant us, O merciful God, that this our offering may find acceptance with you, and that through it the wellspring of all blessing may be laid open before us, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth, he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state. By his suffering, canceled out our sins by his rising from the dead. He has opened the way to eternal life. And by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. So with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy. Indeed, holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, once more giving thanks. He said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world. For by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, 
and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Cloud, St. Anne, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Donald, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. May this heavenly mystery, O Lord, restore us in mind and body that we may be co-heirs in glory with Christ to whose suffering we are united whenever we proclaim his death, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Uh, Just so it's clear, Erica and Bob are hot. They're really great people, okay? So everything I said was completely fictitious. Don't spread it around. We love having them. They're great parishioners. Okay, good. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in the peace and love of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join us in verses 1, 3, and 5 of our closing hymn. Verses 1, 3, and 5. with joy is cold. 